Welcome to NYLA 2020 On Demand. This session was previously recorded for the NYLA 2020 virtual conference. It is available to you through December 31st, 2020. Please note, once viewed, each on-demand program is eligible for one continuing education credit. Links to materials and presenter contact information have been archived in a Google folder and are made available after conference. Support files and documents can be found in session files below the program description. Any questions about the NYLA 2020 virtual conference digital platform can be directed to Christina at NYLA.org or you can call 800-252-6952. The Refugee and Immigrant Experience in Comics is sponsored by ESRT and co-sponsored by SCLA, SRRT, YSS, and PCRT. And now our presenter, Joanne Wong. Take it away, Joanne. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining in today's presentation. This is a topic that's very near and dear to me personally, and so I'm really excited to kind of Get the ball rolling on this presentation. And so just a quick note is that um, during this presentation, if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to reach out and contact me at jwong at queenslibrary.org. So let's just get right into it. So we're going to start with a few definitions. Um, the reason why I wanted to start off this way is that I wanted to be clear um, we're going to be throwing tons of terms here and there, and I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. So to begin, um, when we say immigrant, what do we mean? When we say immigrant, we mean a person who comes to a country to take up permanent residence. When we talk about refugee, this is the definition that we have from the UN High Commissioner of Refugees and it is someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. Now, to, when we're talking about um, the stories of people who are refugees, whether um, in just typical narrative or in uh, graphic novels, one major theme is of resettlement. And so when we talk about resettlement, that means that we're providing the refugee with legal and physical protection, including access to civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights similar to those enjoyed by nationals. And so um, the US is actually a host country for refugees, um, among many others. And so I'll be going over that in a little bit, but just wanted to keep you up to date on that particular uh, definition of that. So in terms of new Americans, so when we talk about immigrant and uh, refugee experience, that is a worldwide global experience. However, just for today's purposes, we are gonna mention new Americans um, just because uh, we are uh, currently virtually in, in New York State. Um, and so when we talk about a new American, we're talking about a recent immigrant to the US or the child of a recent immigrant. Now some key facts. So one of the things um, when I was talking about this presentation with someone earlier, they were saying, you know, why are we focusing on these particular two groups? Like why, why are we, um, when we're talking about these graphic novels and texts, why is this the starting point that you wanted to uh, begin your presentation? And I think one of the things is that, you know, in order for us as libraries to be truly inclusive, we really have to take into account the data that supports that there are many people with these backgrounds that are living in the United States. You know, there is a lot of data to back us up. Even in 2020, the numbers are uh, very, very high in terms of just what we would consider the, in terms of like just even in the first three months of this year. And so to go off of that, just for some data stats. So this is based on the Department of Homeland Security Legal Immigration and Adjustment of Status Reports. And so this particular report, what it does, it covers lawful permanent residents. These are people who um, have uh, green cards. Uh, there we are also covers refugee arrivals, naturalizations, and non-immigrant admissions. 
So for this particular slide and for today's purposes, we're gonna be talking about lawful permanent residents, um, refugees, and people who have been naturalized. And so when we talk about the quarter one of fiscal year 2020, we're meeting from January to March. And so during that time, the amount of people who were able to become green card holders was 256,488 people. That's a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, even in the first three months, even with the way 2020 was, you know, that is that is still um, a very substantial number, I think, um, in terms of the data that we have. Um, when you look at the reports, they say that this is kind of the general number you would have around this time period. But it's, you know, when we think in terms of the larger scale of what, in terms of like the large scale of just like, you know, how many people were expecting. I know for myself, when I looked at that number, um, I was surprised. Um, even in terms of people who uh, came here as refugees, the number was 3,220. And to me, I thought, you know, that's a, that's a really big number for just three months. Um, and that number is actually a number in decline. There is actually, um, there is actually, that number has declined just a little bit from last year's um, record. But even still so, you know, those are, you know, this is data and data is really important, but we also have to remember that behind each number, there is a person behind that. And I think humanizing this data is what um, graphic novels really helps with. Um, and then just one last piece of data I wanted to cover is that um, according to the Pew Research Center, there were 10.5 million unauthorized immigrants in 2017, um, which is about 3.2% of the population. And so once again, um, in terms of the, and just in terms of the larger scope, you know, that is a lot of people in the US who are um, currently having this particular status. And so when we are talking about our communities, you can't talk about our communities without addressing um, people who are uh, coming as immigrants or refugees because, you know, the numbers do signify regardless if the numbers have stayed relatively the same or numbers in are in decline, there's a person behind each data, data point that we have to remember um, and that they deserve as much um, respect and dignity um, as everyone else. So because we are in NYLA and we're talking about New York State, um, I did also wanna go into this small data point, which is based on the 2019 American Community Survey one-year estimate data profile. And so according to this particular data profile in 2019, there are about almost over 4 million people in New York State who are foreign born. Um, in terms of naturalized, um, that's about over 2 million. And people who are currently do not have citizenship right now is a little bit over 1 million. In addition, the number says that um, since 2010, there has been 111,000 about uh, of foreign born individuals who have entered since 2010. So kind of taking the national scope and the local scope, you know, I think one thing we can all agree is that um, we can't talk about our communities without addressing the fact that there are immigrant communities in our neighborhoods. There are people who are coming to the US as, uh, and to New York State as refugees. And just as I mentioned before, they deserve the same dignity and respect as everyone else. And they also deserve the same reading, um, reading variety that we have in our libraries. And so that kind of just leads really well into my next portion of just who is our audience? So when we think of audience, the way that I kind of was deconstructing this was, you know, when you're thinking of your libraries, communities, who do you think of? Um, are you including, you know, new Americans? Are you including patrons who are in the process of learning English? You know, when when you're thinking of demographics, if are you coming up with a more homogeneous um, community set where you know there's maybe one type of person that you kind of anticipate coming through the door? And if so, um, are you thinking of our mythical non-users, um, which? Our mythical non-users can also include patrons who are, are, as I mentioned over here, new Americans who are in the process of learning English. And in, in, if that happens to be a case where you know um, you're not seeing many people of who might be 
of a different background, you know, are we making our own branches as inviting as can be? Are we including new Americans corners that are very prominently based in our branches? Are there signs that are in other languages are that are in other languages more than more than one other language? You know, having multiple languages available. You know, are we making the our branches inviting so that if someone who is either coming from an immigrant background or a refugee background walked by, would they feel that this was a place for them? In addition, um, because we are talking about uh, graphic novels in this particular um, topic, you know, we have to think of when we're talking about the stories of new Americans, um, we do have to think of, are we also allowing them to be um, the topic of their stories? Are they allowed to be the creators of their stories? And are they also able to consume stories as well? So we have to think of it in terms of just the multi-layered part of, are we getting books that allow new Americans to, on uh, new Americans specifically with the immigrant and refugee experiences, are we giving them the opportunity to tell their own stories? Are we giving them the opportunity to be the subject of their own stories? And are we giving them the opportunity to have the same reading variety that we're um, giving to our general community as well? So why graphic novels? So another question that someone had for me um, when I had first started this presentation is, why don't you just go through speaking about just generally about books, about the immigrant and refugee experience? Why, why are you starting with graphic novels? And the reason why is because graphic novels has a really interesting, I think, effect on people. It has, I think it has shown time and time again that it, it really can help inspire empathy and compassion in our readers. Um, one example actually is really interestingly is that a lot of medical schools, um, one of them that I'm gonna highlight here and also um, I'll include the link in the references, is the Jefferson University. They actually have a course now for their medical students um, that is a comic book making. And it's supposed to help improve the observation skills of their students, but also help foster communication skills and compassion in their students so that when they're speaking with their patients, uh, they are more keyed in with how to really connect with their patients. Um, and to really convey the information that is needed. And so that I thought was a really interesting fact that you know even in medical professions, comic books are being used to foster empathy. And so you know, I think one of the articles that I used for this presentation, um, Jesse Karp says, you know, we associate words with intellect, but we associate art with emotion. When you mix those two together, you're just going to get um, just a very, very interesting interpretation uh, where the reader is going to be participatory, participating in the creating of the story um, with the interpretation. And I think the best person who um, really identifies how graphic novels encourages this is that in Rachel Marie Crane Williams' article, which is referenced um, at the end of this presentation with the citation. Um, she references uh, Candace Jesse Stout, who says, art allows viewers to step into the eyes of another and consider a different point of view. It is the aesthetic experience that makes possible these privileged moments through which students can leave new experiences and move beyond the limitations of the self. And continuing off of that, you know, there's another author that is mentioned in that article is that David Swanger says, you know, art engenders empathy because successful art creates a connection between the participants' sensibilities, the sensibilities of the artists, and if the artist representational, the figures within it. So graphic novels really because of their visual nature and their literary nature really, really drives in home that it requires you as the reader to see and experience someone else's lived experiences and someone else's emotions. Um, and that you get, to, you get to interpret that 
um, in relation to your own experiences as well. And so I think this really goes into my next slide of in terms of, you know, when we're talking about these graphic novels, you know, why is it important for the immigrants and refugees? So kind of hearkening back to what I said earlier, you know, we're talking about you know, being both the subject and consumer of your stories. With these types of stories where, you know, um, immigrants and refugees are at the forefront of their stories, it's really a way for us to humanize the individual. You know, we can say, you know, this group is, is, is here and this group is here. But when you're actually seeing in a graphic novel, a, a the singular experience of someone, experiencing the kind of um, situations that they're being put into, it really creates a humanizing experience. Um, and then therefore you as the reader employs and practices those empathy um, points that I mentioned in the last slide. And so I think this also, and I really highly recommend, the citation is at the end of these slides. There's an article by Dominic Davies called Crossing Borders, Bridging Boundaries, Reconstructing the Rights of the Refugee in Comics. I cannot stress how, how much I recommend this article, especially in this particular context. The reason being is that, that in the article, they go into the difference between journalism um, to cover the immigrant refugee experience versus um, covering that experience in comic books. And one thing that they really make an interesting point is, is you know, when you have a comic book or a comic strip, a graphic novel, you can't decontextualize the story from the image. Um, so one thing that they say is, you know, when you do photographic journalism, you know, the image does not necessarily have the story attached to it they can get separated. And when they get separated, what ends up happening is that our, the meaning behind it is now, the, the meaning and intention we have behind that photograph can get lost because we're separating story and image. With a comic strip and a comic panel, and you know, in a comic panel, you're having both the words and the images inside together. So you're seeing both the visual experience and the textual experience of someone. You can't separate that from one another. Thereby, when you do that, you're end, what you're doing is you're basically putting the stories at the forefront. You're making sure that the context behind the image, behind the text is there. They're not going to be separated. Um, and so, that was their argument that, you know, as we're going forward, you know, some of these stories really uh, do benefit from having this graphic novel interpretation. Um, and another thing that they also mentioned, uh, which I found really interesting, is that um, when we're talking about these, these particular stories, you know, it's really, requiring a participatory uh, part on our readers. So kind of going into why is it important for our communities? You know, one, as I mentioned, it creates empathy. Two, it creates diversity in our collections um, and makes it truly an inclusive experience for anyone in our community to be reading these. But also that with this participatory nature of comics, you know, because we're utilizing empathy, because we're really putting ourselves into the shoes of another person. You know, this article that um, I was mentioning before, it makes a really interesting case that this causes us to, as the reader reflects on some of the complicit natures of us being citizens in our host countries, of just truly understanding what it means to be in a host country and how these borders and boundaries that we create in our host countries are creating these really um, sometimes traumatic experiences for immigrants and refugees, thereby um, really kind of going back to why it's important for immigrants and refugees. When you're, as a community member, reading these stories, you are really kind of putting yourselves in these shoes. And then when you see how someone else's experiences is, you know, this is a way to really especially with the unfortunate 
rise of just xenophobia that's been happening, you know, this is a great this is a, a great way to kind of introduce to people, well, you know, when we talk about immigrants and refugees, these are human beings too. You know, we're not, you know, they have their own stories and they have just their own um, specific situations that they're being put in and that we should be, we should be caring, um, especially for um, in certain cases where the uh, situation of getting to a host country has been very, very um, difficult. And so I think, um, you know, any community can benefit from having these types of stories in our collections. And so one last thing I wanted to mention about why is it important for immigrants and refugees is that also, um, and this is something that is not necessarily mentioned as much, um, but graphic novels in general are very useful in an English as a second language um, or English in another language um, uh, context. Uh, we should be able to offer them <clears throat> these books to read and reflect on their own experiences and also um, having diversity um, as well. So when we're giving our books to people um, and especially for instance in an ESOL context, you know, having stories that they can read to A, help them practice English, but also B, um, really give people um, the opportunity to learn a new language with experiences that they um, are can connect to as well. One last thing I wanted to mention before we go into our next slide is that, you know, having graphic novels in other languages than English, I think is something that we should all be trying to do. Um, I think one of my favorite examples of this is there is, um, so back uh, maybe two or three years ago, there was a gentleman who he was um, Syrian and he had moved to Japan for his studies. And then uh, what ended up happening was when everything was happening in Syria, uh, his name is Obada Kusuma. What he did was that he started translating this manga series called Captain Tsubasa. Um, into Arabic. And then what he did was that he was able to give those books and donate them to refugees, Syrian refugees. Um, and I think the really great part of that story is that, you know, graphic novels are an opportunity for us to really lose ourselves and enjoy um, these stories. And so, especially for these children who are dealing with very, very traumatic events, you know, having this opportunity to read something for fun and to just, you know, lose yourself in this world of Captain Tsubasa, I think it really showcases why having these graphic novels in languages other than English is, is really important in our collections. Because for instance, if you have someone who's coming into your branch who is just learning English, um, and they just want to, they just want to read something for fun. You know, if, do we have the graphic novels that they would typically read for fun? Uh, do we have them in our collections for our communities? And that's a question I think that we can all um, reflect on um, as we go further into this presentation. And so, as I mentioned, why is it important for immigrants and refugees? Because it's humanizing. It's a reflection of themselves, and it's also really helpful in an ESOL context. Um, in terms of any community, one, it's the empathy building that we create, the participatory nature that we're creating, that uh, participatory actions that we're requesting from our reader, and also creating more inclusive reads. Because at the end of the day, what we want is that we want to create a collection that is really provides that if any person walks in, the, the ideal would be that if anybody walks into your door, they have the same reading variety of what they can choose in the library. And that is kind of extending also into graphic novels. Are we having graphic novels that cover all experiences, um, including immigrant and refugee experiences? Are we having graphic novels in all languages? Um, are we providing that for our patrons? something to reflect on as we go into our next slide. So this is um, a slide that I think is, this was something that came out of when I was creating this presentation of just, you know, when we talk about generational understanding, 
I mean in the terms of just, you know, in terms of like first generation, second generation, third generation. Um, I know there are many different um, uh, ways of interpreting first generation. For myself, I interpret first generation as being the first generation that is born in the US um, in your family. And so there are two ways that I look at this. Why is it important? Um, so in terms of the first part, it's the historical context that we forget. Um, one of the things that I found really um, just very interesting in terms of just how we remember things was in George Takai's They Called Us Enemy. The reason why I wanted to point this one out is because there's a really interesting line in the book where the narrator, who is George Takai, says, you know, there were memory is a funny thing. And like we choose to remember what we want and we adapt as we can. But our parents, who are the ones who were truly understanding what was happening, they don't want to talk about their trauma. They don't want to relive their trauma. And I think that also extends into Mouse as well. Uh, Mouse, where, you know, it's in terms of, so Mouse is in terms of um, World War II with the concentration camps. You know, there is trauma for the people who have experienced this in person. Um, and just for clarification, they call this enemy. Um, it's about George Takai's experience of growing up in the internment camps um, that were that was happening during World War II. And both of them, you know, our our parents, you know, our grandparents who have lived through these experiences, you know, these are things that you might not want to, they might not want to relive. It's it's trauma. And you know, they processing that is just very, very difficult. So in terms of like later generations, like first, first generation, second generation, third generation, and so on and so forth, you know, these are, these comic books are in a way, um, a way for us to connect to that history that isn't necessarily taught in history books. And then also because it's being told on such a personal level um, and through an individual story that it really connects us, I think, with our history um, about who we are, um, especially if we ourselves are identifying with the characters in the story. Um, it, it gives us a really good starting point of what is our history and how can we start to reconcile with what that means to us today. The other part that I wanted to talk about in terms of general um, generational understanding is that these comic books, I think, do a really great job in, in terms of talking about cultural identity and cultural assimilation. Um, so the ones that I'm going to really point out today is American Born Chinese and Pashmina. And so in both of these stories, you have um, younger, younger uh, children who are really just coming to grips with what it means to just connect with their cultural identity and in in, a, in an American society, not be ashamed of it. Um, one of the really, when I was doing research for this presentation, something that I found that was really interesting is about the culture assimilation process in America. And the Stanford Public Policy Department raises this question of, is are immigrants able to successfully integrate or are they always going to be considered an alien presence? And so their research covered the mass migration from 1920 to 1940. And they were, they were noticing that the main way for people to assimilate is by naming. And so that the more American your name sounded, you know, the more likely you were able to get, um, there was this weird correlation between, you know, if your, as your names became more American sounding, what opportunities arose for you? But if you were, your names were more foreign sounding how it re even though it reinforced ethnic identity it can lead to a lot of discrimination and so what ends up happening i think that these two books cover really well is just you know these are um in both books i find that you know the the main character is you know trying to trying to really fit in with american society but how to really balance that with also your cultural identity um, ethnic identity of, of who you are and how to be proud of being both. 
Um, I will give a shout out to American Born Chinese. That book came out around the time when I was when I was um, when I was a a, a kid um, as a library user. And I will say, you know, I was talking about this with someone recently. Um, what's been really great has been seeing the amount of diversity that has been coming out in graphic novels. Um, I remember when American Born Chinese came out, it was like the only uh, graphic novel that I knew of that had um, an Asian American lead in it. And so it's great to see how from American born Chinese, um, many of the examples we're gonna show uh, today have come out um, in terms of just really expanding the diversity we have in this particular uh, type of format. So in terms of what do we add to our collections? So my main thing has always been um, to believe that we should have collections for all. Um, so in terms of some of the books that we had on our last page, you know, those books I think can be read by children's teens and adults. Um, I know typically in a lot of branches, we say, you know, a lot of these comic books are um, separated into those three categories, but I really do think um, a lot of, especially these children's and younger teen um, graphic novels, they're, they're really great and they should also be recommended to a lot of our adults. Um, as I was talking to a graphic um, artist recently, and as he had mentioned, um, children's comics and these younger teen comics, they're more of all ages reads because we as adults can really learn um, from some of the some of the stories and also the the morals that are coming out of these uh, children's graphic novels. And so I really do think kind of highlighting it as more like as an all ages reads and then for especially for adult reads having them more um, of course, there's certain content that is more suited for adults, having adult reads, but then, you know, thinking of also when you're doing reader's advisory, also recommending to adults some of these children's graphic novels, especially about the immigrant refugee experience, just because I think they do such a fantastic job of just really capturing um, these stories in this format. So in terms of international languages, once again, talking about having graphic novels that are in both, that are both being translated into English. Um, so, it, so like for instance, like international um, publishers where their books are being translated into English, but also having books that are available in languages other than uh, English. Um, and so for instance, having maybe books from another country that graphic novels from another country that are still in the original language. I think that's something to uh, really start thinking about as we create our collections. Um, another thing is about accessible collections. So especially during COVID-19, um, a lot of things has been shifted online, including eBooks and, and e-graphic novels. And so when we're talking about these immigrant and refugee comic books, comic books about these topics, you know, are we, having them available both as in-person and as e-content. And also, are we having books that, graphic novels that are not in English, both available in person and online? So really trying to make it, especially during this time where virtual words, worlds are becoming more and more prevalent, um, having both available. So um, really having, you know, especially as we're having these stay at home, orders and things like that, really having these resources available as e-content, but then for people who might not have access to these digital devices, still having them accessible in person as well. So one thing I always like to note is that immigrants and refugee stories does not automatically equal trauma. Um, yes, there is um, in certain stories, there is trauma involved, um, and we do need to ensure that those stories are brought to light. But we also, um, you know, there's a wide varied range of experiences that we also do want to cover. But, you know, we do want to, of course, um, have stories where we really highlight um, and show this, show the importance of, of why we are, why we need to why we need to show empathy towards immigrants and refugees, but also showing like other experiences as well. So I think a really good actually um, story for that would be both uh, for Anya's ghost. So Anya's ghost, you know, where she's a Russian um, immigrant who's come to the U.S. She's starting high school in the U.S. and you know, it's a story more about 
assimilating into American culture, American culture and just kind of um, that stage of your life. But also, you know, a, teen, a, a, a typical teenager's experience combined with um, exploring culture identity. There's also a ghost in the story. Um, and so it's really interesting just to see like for that story where, you know, I, um, you know, she is she is an immigrant and it's told from the on, onset, but you know, it's not the trauma isn't her isn't isn't her defining characteristic. Her defining characteristic is, you know, teenager just trying to fit in. In terms of when stars are scattered, when stars are scattered, I think is also a really good um, way to to view this. Is in terms of the the story um, is actually based on a true story. Um, as you can see, the one of the co-authors is is the lead character in the story. His name is Omar. And one of the things that I think this story does really well is kind of going back into what we're talking about empathy and really sitting in on someone else's personal experience. It really covers, I think, the life in a refugee camp from the eyes of a child. Um, I think this book is great whether you're a child, whether you're whether you're an adult um, or a teen. It's a really good exploration of that. But, you know, and there is trauma involved in the story. Um, I don't want to spoil anything there, it, but there are certain um, situations that Omar, Omar has to go through or has gone through that has caused trauma. But that's also balanced with Omar just talking about, you know, the friends that he has in the refugee camps, you know, the daily um, things that they do at school, like, uh, like how he how he, uh, my one of one of the one of the like funny parts of the story is just you know when they're when they talk about when the family gets a goat, and kind of how the goat, um, you know, is has has its own name and all that kind of stuff, um, and just how they all interact with the goat. Uh, but I think it's it's a really good balance the story of balancing a story that does have trauma, and does have some really sad moments in it. But also balances it with also just the uh, daily experience of someone who is living in a refugee camp, and also just the friends that you know, and family and community that is created in the in these um, in the refugee camp, and really showcasing that you know, while trauma can be a part of life, trauma isn't the only defining characteristic. Um, in terms of Polina and I was there, American Dream, both of them are um, about. Uh, immigration. So for Polina, Polina is about a ballet dancer who moves um, from Russia into, I believe it is France. And so what they do is, you know, they, it's about kind of just the new exploration and trying to assimilate into a new culture, um, specifically through the different types of dance. Um, I Was the American Dream is a really fun uh, story about um, being a first uh, generation um, for a uh, first generation and also kind of covers about when you're growing up you know when when you look different um, how do you how do you cope with that how do you cope with you know having multiple identities um, and so because especially in this in this uh, particular story the main character is biracial and so kind of when you're biracial and you're and both of your parents are immigrants like what is that experience for uh, of just finding your culture ad identity in the United States, but I will also say, um, you know, it's a very very fun book too as well. You know, there's there's a lot of times when I was reading that particular one where I was chuckling because um, once again you can see yourself in other people's experiences and especially like if you can connect to as well. I think that's really important. And so in all four of these stories, I think these are good representations where it's you know. While trauma can be present in stories about immigrants and refugees, we shouldn't make it the only defining characteristic when we are reading these stories. You know, these characters who are a lot of times also based on real people. So for instance, the, when I was the American Dream and when stars are scattered, they are based on real stories, you know, that their stories um, are more than just trauma stories, but their, their stories can cover so many other experiences and emotions and we really want to highlight that in order to really 
understand these experiences um, and make it more humanizing versus um, tokenizing their experiences. So in terms of um, one thing I've been mentioning has been about finding international titles. So uh, specifically looking for publishers that are put publishing um, graphic novels that are set in their original language, um, printing uh, translations of graphic novels from other countries. And so really um, these are the best place to look for is starting from the publishers. Just for a few examples, we have Europe Comics, um, who does a lot of translated uh, graphic novels. So does Arsenal Pulp Press. Um, and sometimes we forget, but even Viz Media. Um, manga is, 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 an, is an international um, title, essentially. And I think uh, Viz Media with manga has done a really great job of, of bringing in experiences and stories that um, and, and bringing them to a wider audience within the US. So definitely start, try to look for publishers that are publishing these types of books because I think they can really help benefit uh, your collection and really help to um, really diversify what you have available for both your all general community but also for communities that have refugee or and or immigrant backgrounds. Um, in terms of when you're looking for these publishers that are publishing this material, I will say in my own personal research, so in those three that I just mentioned, those are um, some really good examples, but a lot of the time when you're looking for international graphic novels, they're not, they, there's not necessarily, there, there are few publishers that are publishing only that. Often you'll find publishers that have are publishing lots of stuff and then this is kind of one of the tabs that they're covering. And so just keeping that of note, because I know like for instance, Random House UK um, is doing uh, also tons of international translated uh, titles for graphic novels, but you know they are also covering a lot of other materials as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, when you're looking for these types of publishers is that sometimes you know graphic novel tr translated graphic novels are a are a section that they are covering um and so within like kind of their larger publishing house so where to start um so as i was uh telling becky at the start of the uh, prior to recording um you know finding list and finding finding websites dedicated to talking about comic books in the refugee and immigrant experience can be can be a little bit um tough to find um i do find that a lot of the time what you're going to find are articles and you know lists that come out occasionally where they say you know these are five books that you should include um, but not necessarily an ongoing like website that is curating all of this material, not necessarily a um, not necessarily like a full um, like database of it. So just some places that you can start out though when you're starting to look for this is really check out Goodreads and other book list sites. So you're gonna see it on the next slide. But Go Goodreads, there was someone who made like a I think it was 20 book list of a good place to start. And some book list sites such as Publisher Weekly has some good um, like 10 best reads related to this topic. Another thing is to also rethink some of your traditional comic books when you're talking about them with your patrons. So for, in for instance, Superman is technically a refugee in the comics. Um, and so, you know, when you're talking to your uh, patrons about this, you know, maybe when you're doing reader's advisory, this is something where if they're interested, for instance, in, in characters like Superman really being like, hey, have you ever thought of this character as um, this experience? And so that is like, I think a really good jumping point also when you're doing Reader's Advisory to maybe start recommending these more diverse reads um, about the immigrant and refugee experience. Um, other things is to check out, even though there's maybe not websites dedicated specifically to immigrant, and refugee experiences uh, for graphic novels, there are websites that are dedicated to about diverse reads. Um, when we're talking about diverse reads, um, you know, things like we need diverse books is like the first thing that comes to mind, but often they'll have resources to other sites, to other resources that maybe could point you in the right direction. 
Lastly is um, something that is, uh, I think, of interest is Webtoons. So um, if you do not know what Webtoons is, Webtoons is created content um, for like comic serials. Um, you can read them online or in an app. And the reason why I wanted to include them here today is specifically because of their translation uh, site, which you can see the link down here. What they do is that, you know, well, Webtoons First is, is a worldwide uh, company. And what they do is, you know, you can upload your own comics. And, you know, if you get to um, like a certain popularity with your comic, your comic can go into um, another portion of their website. And um, it, it's, it's a really interesting way of seeing the comic book industry in a serial format online. But what's really cool about the translation part is it's a, basically what they do is that um, or because it's worldwide, they want people from around the world to read all the comics on their site. So what they do is that they have their comics available online for people to translate into other languages. And so, you know, some of the, I was, I was looking at this the other day, some of their, you know, very popular comics, you know, people, they're getting the, the community is helping out in the translation. So there's like one comic serial where it's like, a, where, you know, like 70, 78 chapters and someone has, has uh, translated the entire thing into Spanish. So Spanish readers could, uh, could read it. You know, the, the amount of languages on that site is a lot of just what, what is available um, for you to read. And so definitely, especially as we're talking, when we were talking about before of having, you know, resources for people who, you know, if they're just learning English, but they just want to read something for fun and they like graphic novels, you know, this um, translate.webtoons.com might be something of interest to turn people to because a lot of these co uh, comics um, are being actively translated by the community online um, for, the, for the comics that are uploaded to Webtoons. Um, and so definitely check that out. In terms of some starting points, so as I mentioned, there are a lot of, well, maybe not necessarily a website, there are a lot of good lists. Um, the Seattle Public Library has a shelf talk blog um, that came out actually um, just a few days ago uh, that I think is really useful. Goodreads has a, has a good like starting list about um, work on migrants, refugees, and human trafficking. Um, and then also with uh, Publisher Weekly, they have the works on migration and human trafficking. So definitely you can click on all these links and they'll uh, send you over there. Other starting points is um, social justice books. Um, the link uh, drives you to their graphic novels section on their website. And when I was looking through it, I thought it was a really good resource for um, if you're starting to look into getting more graphic novels that cover the refugee or immigrant experience, this is a great place to start. Book Riot has a really good um, list that they created for recent comics. Um, and another thing is that Barnes and Nobles and Amazon actually have really great sections. So the link for Barnes and Nobles goes straight, straight directly to the international graphic novel section. Um, and, it's, and it's a really good curated set of books that they have there. And then for Amazon's comics and graphic novel section, one thing that I think that they did a really great job in is that they do have a lot of books in other languages than English. So for instance, if that is something that you're interested in adding to your collection, when you click that link and you go to their comic and graphic novel section, you scroll down, you can adjust the language facets that are on the left, bottom left hand side. And so for instance, if you want books in Chinese, graphic novels in Chinese, you just click the facet and then I'll take you to all graphic novels that are specifically written in Chinese. Um, and they do that for many, many languages. And so for instance, if that's also another avenue where you're interested in going into, Amazon would actually be a really good resource for finding uh, some books to start out with. So before we end today's um, presentation, I also want to talk about ESOL classrooms and comics. Um, and so when we think of graphic novels, you know, there's, there's three things that make up a graphic novel. It's the visual codes, which is the images, the written text, the cultural context, and all three of those together make a graphic novel. Now, the reason why that this is really useful in an ESOL classroom is that when you have the visual codes and the written text, Together, they really do help to support one another to create a full-fledged story. 
Um, you know, for instance, when you're reading a text, if you don't fully understand what's happening, you can use the visual code to, to uh, supplement that and vice versa. And so, and in addition, in cultural context, there's an article that, um, that I ref that I, is it's in the references, but basically saying that, you know, graphic novels do not exist in a vacuum. They exist in the cultural context in which they are being written in. So they rep they they use an example of you know the 90s grunge haircut that you can have and so you know outside the US that might not be something we that is not as well known about but in the US we it's something that has become almost like a cultural symbol and so they were saying that graphic novels are a really good way for when you're trying to teach about um, intercultural learning uh, this is where you can learn about your current country or about another country. The graphic novel really helps support that by having both the visual and, and written codes exemplifying some of the cultural aspects of the country, either the country we're learning about in the text or about the current country that um, we are in, um, if that is where the setting is. And so, one of the things is also they mentioned is that, you know, when you have the text and the words together, you know, you really have mental imagery that fully fleshes out. And then also it really extends storylines, character development, and goes into really um, deep thinking about a lot of these topics. But then also you're not getting bogged down just in uh, written text. You know, if a reader needs assistance with understanding what is happening in the text, those visual codes can help support and help them to fully understand what is happening in the story. Another thing also is um, in terms of, for instance, some of our older uh, students who are learning, um, who are in the process of learning English, you know, we having a graphic novel to give them to use as kind of a reading tool to assist in, uh, in practicing their skill um, is something where it's, it's a little bit more encouraging. Um, so for instance, if you have an older reader, uh, older learner, and uh, well, I think, you know, handing them um, maybe like a picture book, like it, picture book is extremely useful um, in this type of learning. But if you're, if you're giving it to someone who is much older, they might look at it and say, um, this isn't the most encouraging, like I have to start all the way back at the back at the bottom to to relearn a whole language, like starting from the very beginning. By giving them a graphic novel, you know, there's a little bit more. First, um, they might have a background in reading comics already and being familiar with it and or familiar with like the context of what it is and have a more positive experience with it. So they're more likely A, to be more fully engaged and B, when you give a graphic novel, there's also the assumption that um, it's maybe for a little bit uh, older, um, uh, like for instance, if you give a graphic novel, if it's, um, if it's for a older readership, um, but then you still have those visual contexts to assist uh, the reader uh, understand what is happening, it might just give it um, a little bit more encouragement for the uh, student in terms of reading the context. And so with these visual codes and the body language that is written into that, as well as the words and the culture context, it's just really useful in terms of these classrooms where we're teaching English. And so when we're looking at these uh, presentations of just, you know, what can, where can we use the graphic novel in the classroom for um, ESOL? Um, you know, there can be used for reading comprehension and they can be used for really understanding cultural context. But another thing that's really good is um, when you do your, when you do discussion and then when you let your students write a comic themselves and really being able to utilize that. I like to call it the more, um, the getting used to the colloquial back and forth that happens in comic in comic strips, but also happens in real life. And so I'm actually gonna just cover really quickly um, in terms of, so during, uh, prior to COVID-19, 
Um, I had been talking with our ESOL um, volunteer about, hey, like maybe we can start in our group that we host at our branch, maybe we can start moving into having introducing graphic novels into the sessions. Um, unfortunately, COVID-19 hit. And so what ended up happening was that we moved our ESOL conversation group entirely virtually online. And so, however, we still wanted to incorporate parts of this graphic novel setup. Um, graphic, uh, and so we, what we did is we have uh, these six panels with the comic strip. And what we have is, you know, we have these um, two characters talking. And so what we do is, you know, basically what we end up doing is we kind of write the comic strip together in our conversation group. So I would say like, how are you? And then my the, the person I'm working with, co-hosting with that day will say like, I'm feeling this way. And then basically us mirroring how that conversation looks like and then asking our participants to what their answer would be. And so in this sense of a program, what we're doing is we're using this comic strip as a backdrop for us to really highlight how we can have, how conversations um, can, can go, um, how there is a very back and forth nature, and also um, give also people, so for instance, we always have uh, options of what people can answer with on the sign, um, just really getting people comfortable with the conversational nature that happens both in comic strips and in regular conversation, and also um, just get by by constantly doing this. Um, we have found that many of our participants, um, especially as they feel more comfortable with us, they feel more comfortable um, engaging in conversations with us in this back and forth um, comic strip format, where we ask them a where we mirror how a question would be answered. Um, for instance, where it says, how are you? Where it says the post-it note that says, I am doing well, you know, I would move that over. So really mirroring that in a textual context, in a visual context, and then also in a speaking context as well. And so really using all three of those types of um, ways of learning to really uh, get people engaged into answering these questions, getting used to answering um, questions like these. Um, and so the references that I have for this particular uh, presentation, um, I highly recommend reading uh, some of these uh, articles. They're really interesting. Um, and I think they are, especially if you're looking into creating more diverse um, reads in your library, specific with immigrant and refugee experiences, this might be a great place to also look at. Um, some of the graphic novels I will mention that were featured, you saw some of their images, uh, was American Born Chinese, uh, Anya's Ghost, The Arrival, The Best We Could Do, I Was Their American Dream, Illegal, Mouse, Pashmina, Polina, They Called Us Anonymity, and When Stars Are Scattered. Um, I do highly recommend um, all of these. Um, and this, this, this list covers both children's, teens, and adults, but I'm a big believer that I think a lot of these um, once again, especially with the children's graphic novels about this, um, really do cover as more of like an all ages read. And so if you have any questions about this presentation, if you're looking to find more about these book lists and all those kinds of things, please feel free to email me at jwong at queenslibrary.org. Thank you so much for joining me for today's presentation. I hope you had a great time and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Joanne. Um, this concludes the NYLA 2020 On Demand program, The Refugee and Immigrant Experience in Comics. We hope you continue to take advantage of all the on demand and live programs the NYLA 2020 annual virtual conference has to offer. Thank you for helping us make this the best virtual conference ever. <laughs>